And we are live here with the group Our Revolution, about to host a discussion on the future of the Democratic Party with former presidential candidate Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont and Democratic National Committee Chair candidate Minnesota Congressman Keith Ellison. Representative Keith Ellison will outline his vision of the Democratic Party as he campaigns to become that Democratic National Committee chair. We'll also hear from Bernie Sanders. He'll um, talk about his vision of the party and American Federation of Teachers President Randy Weingarten, who will be the uh, host tonight. Live coverage here on C-SPAN. I want to welcome you to the AFT. And the first job is that I want to play a video message from former Secretary of Labor, Hilda Solis, who was unable to be on this coast with us today, but wants to make it crystal clear her support for Keith Ellison. I'm Hilda Solis, LA County Board of Supervisor and former Secretary of Labor under the Obama administration. I am pleased to uh, tell you that I am in strong support of Keith Ellison our congressman and someone who has chaired the Progressive Caucus, which I was a member of when I served in the House for eight years. It's been a pleasure to know him and to know that he cares so deeply about all the concerns of all of our citizens and residents in the United States. He's been one of those individuals who's worked so hard to gain so much support. In fact, I know that uh, he's there with you now at AFT with my good friend Randy Weingarten and others that I know support him. Uh, in, in fact, I know that some of our key leadership in the Senate and the House are supporting him, and I just want to cast my uh, vote in support of him as well. I've known him for many years. When uh, he came to the Congress, he asked me to come out and help him talk about the needs of immigrants and to talk about health care coverage and the disparities that exist amongst low-income uh, women. I know he's going to fight hard on the minimum wage. He's going to help protect workers' rights. He's going to make sure that we take care of our environment, and he's going to be there to fight us on every angle to protect a woman's right to choose. These are all important elements, but most importantly, what I think he brings to the table is the fact that he represents the Midwest and he survived there. And I know he is a coalition builder. He's traveled around the country. He can raise money. He has the stamina. And I know that he can, it, he can energize our party the way we need to. And he'll start at the local level with our counties, with our cities, uh, lifting up our Democratic parties around the country and helping to invest to do more voter education and registration and also to fight the good fight. When Trump comes out and says that he wants to deport 11 million immigrants, uh, he knows he's going to be there to stop that. When uh, Trump comes out and says that he wants to build uh, borders around uh, our, our borders uh, to keep Mexicans out or to call out Muslim Americans and things of that nature, I know that he's going to be right there. But more importantly, he's a fighter and he's a friend. And he'll do everything he can in his power to make sure that the Democrats have a good foundation to begin the movement to take back our country and to take back our community, neighborhood by neighborhood. I have no doubt that he'll be up to speed and be able to do it and carry through. So this is Hilda Solis again. I want to thank everyone to my labor brothers and sisters that are watching uh, at AFT. Bienvenidos y felicidades. Y, and I want to wish everyone a happy holiday. Thank you so much. Playing with the live stream. <laughs> so, as I said, um, my name is Randy Weingarten, and I welcome all of you to our house. And you are always welcome to our house because this is the house of fight back, and this is the house of fight for our communities. And so, I am delighted to spend a couple of minutes before I introduce um, our next speaker. But I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about Keith and talking about why I personally endorsed him, why Lee Saunders personally endorsed him, and why the entire labor movement has now endorsed Keith Ellison. Now, why? For any of you who don't know Keith, Keith is an organizer. He's a fighter. And the Democratic Party, of which I am a member and a proud member, 
needs that kind of fighter each and every day in each and every neighborhood and each and every community in America. We need to re-engage and rebuild our party to ensure that our most valuable asset, many of whom in this room fit that, our grassroots activists are engaged and engage others so we elect champions of working families at every level of government. That is what Keith can lead us to do, and that's why I am so, not just impressed with him, but I'm willing to follow him everywhere. Yeah. Look, you see that. Because we need to get back to that trust and that engagement. You saw what Trump did. He found a way with a volume of lies to undermine the trust in every institution that we believe in. And he did it over and over again to create chaos and confusion so nobody would trust anybody. You know what that leads to? And 50 years of progress may go down the tubes in the first 100 days of this person's elevation to president since when you've lost the popular vote by three million votes it's hard to call somebody the actual president having said that keith understands that to win you have to talk to people you have to engage with people you have to listen to people and you have to engage in a shared vision you can tell that he truly believes what he's talking about just by spending three and a half nanoseconds with him. <laughs> Talk to anybody in his district. Talk to working people in Minneapolis and Minnesota. You see the connection that they have. He knows he can't abandon any area, any place in this country. And frankly, I think Keith will be able to unlock the door as Bernie did so well to small donor fundraisers and fundraising that gets resources into our state parties, which is critical for the success of the Democratic Party. Look, I can go on and on and on, but, and I can talk about all those issues, but on every issue that I have been involved in, in my adult life, whether it is labor, whether it is education, whether it is human rights, whether it is civil rights, whether it is environment, whether it is any issue you can think of, Keith is not in the back, but he's in the front of that fight, standing up for all of us. That's why I support, my union supports, educators support, nurses support, college professors support, public servants support, that's why we all support Keith Ellison. Yeah. So, our next speaker is LaToya Williams, who's a federal contract worker at a call center for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as well as a CWA, let's hear it for CWA, and a Good Jobs Nation organizer. Let's hear it for Good Jobs Nation. So I want to thank LaToya for her tireless efforts on behalf of working people. And I want to bring LaToya up to also tell you why Keith is the right choice for working folks in America. Keith, uh, LaToya. Good evening, everyone. My name is Latoya Williams. And I, yes, ma'am. And I am honored to stand here tonight with Keith and Bernie because last week they stood with me and thousands of other striking federal contract workers. I work at a call center for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which you may know as FEMA. Every day I'm on the front lines helping victims of natural disasters. When a hurricane hits, Americans call me to help them rebuild their homes. I'm proud to be able to help people who are temporarily homeless get out of gyms and shelters. 
But here's the irony. I was homeless myself for two years because a federal contract worker that I work for stole thousands of dollars from my paycheck. Not only was I homeless, I have thousands of dollars of medical debt and I have to rely on food banks to feed myself. Last week, when I told my story at the strike, Keith encouraged me to keep fighting and keep organizing. He said that every worker deserves a good union job. That's why as a worker organizing with the Communication Workers of America and Good Jobs Nations, I'm proud to say that we support Keith as the next chairman of the Democratic National Committee. Brothers and sisters, we all need to come together in our unions, in our churches, in our mosques and temples, and in our communities to fight for change. As Keith says, when we fight together, we will win together. Thanks, and it's now my honor. It's, it's now my honor to introduce another Good Jobs Defender. He also believes that when millions of us organize together, nobody is going to stop us. Give it up for Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Well, let me thank LaToya for all the great work that she does and for that wonderful introduction. And let me also thank the tens of thousands of Americans. In fact, we think perhaps hundreds of thousands of Americans from every state in this country who are joining us this evening. Thank you all. And let me also thank Congressman Keith Ellison for his willingness to serve as chair of the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. And I want to thank the many grassroots organizations consisting of millions of Americans who are actively supporting Keith, including Our Revolution, the CWA, the American Federation of Teachers, the National Nurses United Union, Democracy for America, Working Families Party, Move On, Good Jobs Nation, People's Action, People for Bernie, yeah, <laughs> why not, and Free Speech TV. And I also want to thank the many, many members of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives who are supporting Keith. Some of them are Harry Reid, the current Democratic leader in the United States Senate. The new Democratic leader in the United States Senate, Chuck Schumer, is strongly on board. As are Senators Elizabeth Warren, Martin Heinrich, Tammy Baldwin, Amy Klobuchar, Al Franken, Chris Murphy, and Tammy Duckworth. And I want to thank all of them. And there are many, many, many colleagues of Keith in the House, uh, John Conyers, Maxine Waters, Elijah Cummings, many, many others who are supporting Keith, too many to name, and I want to thank them also. And I also want to thank Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York, who today came on board Keith's campaign. Thank you very much, Mayor de Blasio. And I further want to thank the AFT and President Randy Weingarten for allowing us to use their beautiful facility to live stream uh, throughout the country. Randy, thank you very much. All right, now the thank yous are over. Let's get to the meat of the issue here, all right? You know, you got to be polite. That's the right thing to do. What we are doing tonight is not sexy, and it's not going to make the headlines in the newspapers all over the country. But it is unprecedented for the Democratic Party and for the long-term future of our country, and it is of enormous consequence. 
At a time of low voter turnout, at a time, as you all know, when millions of Americans are demoralized politically and are sick and tired of establishment politics and establishment economics, we are gathered here tonight, not only in this building, but all over America, to begin the process of transforming American politics and of creating a government which works for all of the people, not just the 1%. Yeah. That is what we are here to do. And in order to make that happen, our first step is to transform the Democratic Party from a top-down party to a bottom-up party. to create a grassroots organization of the working families of this country, the young people of this country. And I will tell you, having been all over this great nation of ours, the incredible idealism and courage of millions of young people who believe in this country, who love this country, and are prepared to fight to make this country all, in fact, that we can become. And I want to also uh, thank uh, and urge all Americans, regardless of income, regardless of their race, their nationality, their sexual orientation, to jump on into the political process and make the Democratic Party a Democratic Party with a small d, not just a capital D. This election for chair of the DNC is not a personality contest. The media may think it is, but it is not. From what I can gather, Keith's opponents are decent people who want to improve the Democratic Party and want to see us become victorious. The key difference here and what this election is really about is whether we continue the status quo or whether we bring forth a very different vision for the future of the Democratic Party. That is what this election is about. And here is why we need to go forward in a very, very different direction than currently exists. The painful truth, and it's a truth we have got to recognize and not sweep under the rug. The painful truth is that despite President Obama's strong victories in 2008 and 2012, the Democratic Party has lost enormous political ground over the last eight years. That's just the truth. Running against the most unpopular presidential candidate in history, the Republicans have just won the White House. The Republicans now control the United States Senate. The Republicans now control the U.S. House of Representatives. Republican governors now control almost two-thirds of the state houses in this country. And over the last eight years, Democrats have lost some 900 legislative seats from one end of America to the other. That is the simple, indisputable truth. Clearly, Whatever the leadership of the Democratic Party has been doing over the last many years has failed, and we need fundamental change. Yeah. Unbelievably, and this really is quite unbelievable when you think about it, despite competing against an extreme right-wing party, that is so out of touch, so way out of touch with the needs of ordinary Americans. A party, the Republican Party, that advocates cutting Social Security. The American people want to expand Social Security. These guys want to cut it. They want to throw 20 million Americans off of the health insurance they now have. They want to cut Medicare. They want to cut Medicaid. They want to cut federal aid to education. 
despite competing against a Republican Party that in the midst of massive income and wealth inequality, the Republicans want to provide hundreds of billions of dollars to the top 1%, despite competing against a political party which to a very large degree not only does not want to do anything substantive about climate change, they do not even recognize the scientific reality of climate change. But despite all of that, despite all of that and much more, the Democratic Party has lost significant political ground. And we have got to ask why that has occurred. Brothers and sisters, the status quo is not working, and we will not succeed if we continue along the same old, same old path. Now is the time for real change in the Democratic Party. Now is the time to revitalize the Democratic Party and bring in people who have not been welcomed in the past. We should not be afraid of new energy and new faces. We should welcome and embrace new energy and new faces. Now is the time for a chair of the Democratic Party who has a very different vision of the party than those who are in control today. Now is the time for Keith Ellison to become chair of the Democratic Party. As I know many of you are aware of, Keith is currently the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and has been one of the leading progressive voices on all, underlined all, of the major issues facing the middle class and working families of our country. He has been there on picket lines. He's been up front and out front in terms of workers' rights, in terms of the environment and climate change, in terms of the need to create a health care system that guarantees health care to all people as a right. He has been out in front on women's rights, on the rights of the LGBT community, the need for real criminal justice reform, the need for immigration reform, and the need for real tax reform so that Donald Trump and the other billionaires start paying their fair share of taxes. For many, many years, Keith has been there, not as a follower, but as a leader. That's right. Unlike some of the other candidates who are running for chair, Keith knew from day one that the TPP was a disaster for working families and helped us defeat the TPP. <laughs> Keith is, by nature, a grassroots organizer. That is what he does. That is who he is. He is not a creature of the inside the Beltway world. He is a person who lives in the real world, feels comfortable in the real world, and is going to bring the real world into the Democratic Party. As I mentioned when I began, Keith already has the support of some of the strongest grassroots organizations and trade unions in this country, and we have the support of many, many progressive elected officials. Yeah. But we have something even more important than all of that. Yeah. Right now, we have the support of more than 600,000 men and women in every state in this country who have signed petitions to demand and urge that Keith Ellison become the next chair of the Democratic Party. 600,000 people. Our goal, our goal together, and I urge all people who are watching this live stream to get involved in this process, 
Let us take that 600,000 number and make it a million Americans who want Keith as our next bill. Please get your friends and co-workers involved. Please go to OurRevolution.com and get your friends to sign up. Brothers and sisters, we are in a perilous and momentous moment in American history. You all know that. And we are going to need a political party that has the guts to stand with working families, has the guts to take on the big money interests to control, to a large degree, our economic and political life. It is my great privilege to introduce to you someone who I believe is going to be the next chair of the Democratic National Committee. Please welcome Congressman Keith Ellison. How you doing out there, everybody? If there was ever a moment when people who love this country and the people in it need to step up and do everything they can to improve the lives of their fellow Americans, that moment is right now. That moment is now. If I told you you had an opportunity to fight for people who felt vulnerable and scared in this Trump America, would you do it? Yeah. If I told you you had a chance to stand up and fight for working people, would you do it? Yeah. If I told you that you could be the hero of folks who pour the cement, who teach the classes, who take care of the folks in the hospital, you know, the folks who take care of the children, who cook the food, I mean the hardworking people of America, would you step up and do something for them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then that's good because we need you right now to do all of that. Because let me tell you, it's hard to imagine somebody like Donald Trump being elected president, yeah. but in a few days he will be the president. I don't know what stage in the whole spectrum of grief you may be at, but I think we need to arrive at acceptance that he's about to be the president. Yeah. And that means that each of us and all of us have to do every single thing that we can to protect our fellow Americans and to advance the cause of economic and social justice. We have to do it. Yeah. This is a history moment. This is a movement moment. And this moment may well be the moment when the American people fought back to reclaim their democracy of, by, and for the people. Now, you know, Trump, Trump, you know, he, he, he ran saying stuff like, you know, more jobs, new trade model. He said it. He said these things. And as soon as he got in there, he, he said he was going to drain the swamp. Y'all remember that one? Well, he's filling up with lobbyists, billionaires, corporate executives, hedge fund managers, all, all these folks. We're going to have the richest cabinet ever. If you just had a few million, you, you'd be like the poor guy in that bunch. You know, he said, he said he's going to fight for little people, but yet he puts a secretary of education, another billionaire, who is against public schools. When 90% of American school children will go to a public school, Betsy DeVoe is not in favor of public schools and wants to privatize them. You know, he said he was going to help working people get his labor secretary, another billionaire, who makes his billions on the backs of low-wage fast food workers, is actually against the minimum wage and would lower it if he could. You know, oh, and don't stop there. He said he was going to improve our health care system and get his health and human services secretary. You know, Tom Price wants to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, throwing 20 million people off health care. This is the cabinet he's picked so far. He said he was going to appoint the best and most qualified. And yet, Dr. Ben Carson, 
admits he knows nothing at all about housing. He says it. I didn't say it. He said it. So I guess it's no surprise that he nominated a guy who says that there's no such thing as climate change, it's a hoax by the Chinese, to be the head of the Environmental Protection Agency at a time when communities are being washed away because the waves are coming up in Katrina and Sandy and all these kind of places, at a time when people are living in toxic areas all over this country, he, they, he picks an EPA leader who is not in favor of protecting people from environmental hazard. So people, we got our work cut out. We got our work cut out for us. You know, he said he would fight for workers, yet Republicans in Congress ended health care for coal miners. They said, you don't, black lung, lung uh, shaft cave, mine shaft cave-ins, all the hazards of that job, and he, they're doing that, and he's even attacked. He, he had the nerve to attack a hard-working steel worker, local president. Y'all heard about that? All this man, Mr. Jones, was trying to do was to say that, look, you know, you say he's saving all these jobs, but you're not saving them all, and you're giving away the tax base of the people of Indiana to do it. Another corporate giveaway in crony capitalism. Even Sarah Palin saw that. <laughs> right? So the bottom line is he attacks this man on Twitter, which he likes to do to people all the time. So that's what the right wing is doing. The real question is, what are we going to do? That's always the question, people. What are we going to do? We can always count on them to say that rich people don't have enough money and the poor folks have too much money. We can always count on them to say the rich folks need one more tax cut, one more regulation they don't have to follow, and regular working people need one less thing that's going to help them make it through the week. Okay, so that's them. What about us? Are we going to hit the streets? Are we going to organize? Yeah. This is what we got to do. And one of the main things we've got to do right now is reset the future of the Democratic Party. Yeah. We got to reset the Democratic Party on the basis of grassroots activism. We got to reset the Democratic Party on the basis of working people who are striving every single day to make a better life for themselves and their families right here in America. I'm talking about African Americans, white Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans. I'm talking about Asian Americans. I'm talking about people who are Jewish and Muslim and Christian and Buddhist and Hindu and any or no faith at all. I'm talking about folks. I'm talking about folks like you and me. I'm talking about folks like us need to say that the Democratic Party has got to be democratic and it starts with getting some leadership in there that's going to fight for that democracy. And I'm telling you right now, guys, this is the moment we have been waiting for. It's the time for us to stand up and fight back and reclaim our nation. Are y'all ready? Now, look, I want to tell you that I am very proud to have your support. And I'm so amazed at the tremendous turnout we have here tonight, here physically, and the folks that are on the live stream. Big shout out to the folks on the live stream. Give yourselves a hand. This moment right here is historic. Literally hundreds of thousands of people join us right here to talk about the future of the Democratic Party and our country. Million people all over this country listening in. And I'm telling you, if the Democratic Party is going to make any reforms, one of them has got to be that we use moments like this one, mass meetings of hundreds of thousands of people to get together to talk about what we're going to do to make our country better for everyone. We got to include everybody, and we should use moments like this and technological moments like this because basically it's not about the technology and the software, it's about us, the people, and we got to include everybody. And if technology can help us get more folks on the table, well, then let's do it. Y'all all right with that? But I want to say thank you for your support. I want to say thank you to the American Federation of Teachers. These are the folks who teach our kids every day, the folks who give them a shot. The people, you know, I don't know about you, but when I was, uh, and I'm from a big family, 
And when and, and I remember feeling kind of ordinary and not too special, but there was a teacher who said, come here, boy, I think you're a smart kid. And a teacher grabbed me and she said, I know you, stop acting up because I know you're better than that. She said, you're just high spirited. I'm gonna give you some extra problems to do because I know you need a challenge. <laughs> teachers did that for me. They made me feel good about myself and they made other kids in my class. And those teachers, they knew who, which kids were homeless. They knew which kids were being abused at home. They knew what kids need to be challenged a little bit more. They knew the kids who needed to be encouraged a little bit more. God bless those teachers, y'all. Give, put a, get a hand. Let me say thank you to the communication workers of America. The communication workers, you know, the people who make sure that when you answer, when you call, that call gets answered and the phone works. Thank you, CWA. Bless you guys. Move on. Give a hand and move on, everybody. Let me tell you. <clears throat> Thank you to Democracy of America, DFA, awesome. Also, the AFL-CIO, that's the, that's the largest organization of workers in America. Steelworkers, IBEW, United Nurses, and more and more and more. Don't be mad if I didn't mention you. I love you, and I thank you, and we all got to be working together. So give a hand to everybody. You know, let me tell you something. The Democratic Party should be the party of the people. The Democratic Party should be the party for those who want a better future for their children and grandchildren. It should be a party that invests in workers, protects their ability to organize, and fights for a fair wage and good working conditions. The Democratic Party should be a party that believes everyone should have equal access to the American dream and equal rights before the law. The Democratic Party should say, it doesn't matter what your color is. We're going to treat you with fairness and equality and respect. It doesn't matter who you love and go to bed with at night. It doesn't matter who your closest of kin is. They are your choice, and we respect and honor that choice. That's who the Democratic Party should be. The Democratic Party should say whether you were born in America or whether you came here, we respect you, we honor you, and we want to see your families come together. The Democratic Party should be that, that party. We believe that the Democratic Party should be the party of, by, and for the people. Yes. And, and yet, and yet, and yet, we know that even a good car sometimes needs a tune-up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even a good car needs a tune-up. It needs new wheels, new brake pads, new belts, new hoses, new oil. Needs new spark plugs, maybe needs a paint job. Needs to get that window that's been cracked fixed, you know? You gotta maintain and update and invigorate everything. If you just let it slide, it tends not to work so well. Well now, um, I know one, some folks don't wanna hear it. But <laughs> since 2008, Democrats have lost 935 legislative seats and Republicans now control two-thirds of governor's office. And let me tell you, state legislature is very, very important. That is where our voting rights are made. If you, can, if you got same-day voter registration like you do in Minnesota, it's because the state says so. If you have a lifetime ban on voting, if you have a felony like they have in Florida, it's because the state says so. If you can vote, if you never lose your right to vote, never lose your right to vote like they have it in Vermont and Maine, that's because the state says so. How is it impacting the American people's right to fully participate in democracy when 935 legislative seats in state legislatures have been lost to Democrats? How has it affected redistricting? How has it affected the right to vote and cast a ballot and be a part of this democracy? It has devastated us. How has it affect a woman's right to choose? In Ohio, Governor Kasich has said he has a 20-week ban on the right for a woman to select abortion if that's her choice. Let me tell you something. This is none of his business. It's unconstitutional. But he did it. But he did it. Because he wants a constitutional challenge, because he wants the case to go up there, because he wants to see the Supreme Court strip away a woman's right to make decisions for her family and herself and her body. And this is something we have got to take very seriously, but it's going on at the state. Eleven governor seats lost. You know what? Raising the minimum wage is winning on ballot initiatives, but Democrats aren't winning. They like our ideas. 
but somehow our candidates aren't getting through. We need a retool. You know, let me tell you, I don't recommend folks smoke marijuana, but I tell you this, it is crazy to throw people in jail for it. And when you see, and you see that all over the country, these invalid initiatives are passing it, right? For medical and even recreational use. Why fill up the jails for something like that? That doesn't make no sense at all. I'm running for DNC chair because it's time to turn all of this stuff around. It is time and all of us have to step up, each of us. No DNC chair, no president, no elected official can make the changes that have to be made. They're gonna have to be made by the thousands, millions of Americans all across this country who believe in a better quality of life for all people, who believe in the equality of all people, who believe in a fair economy, who believe that people ought to have the right to choose and make their own personal decisions, who believes that climate change is gonna destroy this world for our ability to live on it, unless we do something right now. Yeah. This is what we've got to do. But, but I want to say that we can bring that change that we need. We can stand up to Trump and the Republicans if we get involved and if we re remake this party right now. I want to tell you this, I am a person who believes in unity. Yeah. I do absolutely thank the folks who've been around for a long time and honor their uh, institutional memory and thank them for their service. But I also believe that it is absolutely time for a very serious injection of energy and reinvigoration. Yeah. These two things don't need to be at odds. These things actually, if they work together, can serve us all very, very well. We need the new energy. We need the folks who've been around. We need some unity to come together. And I stand for that unity. Yeah. In fact, I tell you what, I went to Nevada to help people who were supporting my dear friend Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton and sat in a room for five hours as they hammered out a memorandum of understanding so that they could somehow try to work together. But that's the kind of thing. Unity is something that must be fought for. It's something that must be struggled for because we all have our ideas about how things should go. So we need leadership who's going to say we're going to stick together and stay together and hammer it out and maybe cuss each other out a little bit. But at the end of the day, we're going to come out holding hands and being a team. This is the kind of thing we got to have. So we believe in unity. I also believe that we got to stand up tall for small. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, we cannot, we, I absolutely, Howard Dean was right to say the 50 state strategy, but we got to go beyond that now, guys. We need a 3,141 county strategy. We need a strategy that gets granular. We need a block by block. We need a precinct strategy. We need a strategy that gets right down to the nitty gritty. Because you know what? The resources of the Democratic Party need to be moved right down closest to the voter. That's where they need to be. I'm talking about the money, the training, the data, the resources need to be to the people closest to the voter. But I can tell you, city officials and state legislative folks and local county people and just grassroots rank and file do not feel like they are being heard or listened to or included. This is a fact. I'm just telling the truth. And if we want to win, we will listen to our local officials and our grassroots rank and file people. We got to get small. I already mentioned to you, we have got to communicate. We got to use live streaming like we are right now. And this has got to be our regular practice. If we're not talking and listening, we are not going to be able to take everything that everybody knows and put it in service of all of us. All of us together are smarter than any one of us. But if we don't share information and access, we cannot make maximum use of all of the intelligence and creativity that people are coming up with every day. But we, I will mean that we will do these things. We will make use of the talents that we have available to us. So abundant, if only we would let go of our need to control everything and hand over the power to the people closest to the voter, to the voter. Now, you know, I, my home state of Minnesota, I am so proud that I come from a state, and I know you guys are proud of your state too, but there was a man named Hubert H. Humphrey, and he said in 1948, yeah. Hubert Humphrey's worth an applause, y'all. <laughs> <clears throat> Hubert H. Humphrey, he said, 
He said in 1948 at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, he said that America needed to walk out of the shadow of state rights into the bright sunshine of human rights. And when the Democratic Party, Party stood up for human rights for all, some people, like Strom Thurmond and others, they walked out the door because they didn't want human rights for all. The Democratic Party must always be a party that says that we stand for the respect and dignity of all people. We must always be that party. We will never stop being that party. But, but when Walter Ruther said, there's, when Walter Ruther was the former who spoke at the 1963 March on Washington, that, which was not only for civil rights but for jobs as well, when Walter Ruther of the UAW, he got up there and said, the bread box, there, he said that there's a direct line between the bread box and the ballot box. He was right too, wasn't he? So yes, we gotta fight for economic justice. Yes, we gotta make sure that prosperity for working people is available to them and that they have it. We don't need to decide between social justice and economic justice. We gotta have all of that justice together, do we not? You know, I've heard people talk about the white working class versus the rising new American electorate. Well, let me tell you something. We gotta stand for both. We gotta stand for all. We can never sacrifice between the two. We've gotta stand up for each one. And let me tell you, if we don't stand up for both, we are not gonna have neither one. Because they would, let me tell you, because they will use tribalism and racial manipulation to lower our wages. Once they get us fighting with each other on the basis of these things, they always gonna come take the money. You know, let me tell you, Ronald Reagan went to, uh, went to Philadelphia, Mississippi, Philadelphia, Mississippi, and gave a speech about states' rights. This is where Swerner, Cheney, and Goodman were killed and buried. And he used racial manipulation to stir them folk up. And then after he gets in, he does what? Fires the air traffic controllers and really begins a period of wage stagnation in America. So when you use racial manipulation to divide people, invariably you use it to suppress everyone's wages. You understand what I'm saying? So we've got to stay together. So let me tell you, we have also got to turn out the vote. We have got to turn out the vote, people. We have seen in, in 2014, we saw a 70-year low in voter turnout. And the, we have the smallest house caucus that we've had since Truman. In 2016, over 90 million eligible voters did not vote. We say we're only going to campaign in the swing states and we're only going to go to the likely voters. And we leave literally millions of people not participating. And when we do that, we leave, we leave ourselves to lose Wisconsin, which is a blue state. We leave ourselves to lose Michigan, which is the home of the UAW. And we, use our, we, lose, we leave ourselves to lose Pennsylvania. But we also lose Ohio. No way we should lose Ohio. And we also lose Florida. And we lose these states that we should win because we have this strategy that we only going to talk to certain people. What if we started talking to everybody? What if we talked to everybody? Let me tell you this. I want to say this to you. There's a word that I would like us to banish from our vocabulary. I'm going to say it now because I want you to know what word it is. But we, can, we not, we, can we not say Rust Belt anymore? Yeah. Look, I'm from Minnesota. I don't feel rusty. You know what I'm saying? I guarantee you the people in Ohio and Pennsylvania don't feel rusty. They feel it ready to go and to move out and to bring back this country. And I'm going to tell you, this is the industrial Midwest. That's what it is. It's the industrial Midwest. And I'm going to tell you something else. Places like Washington, D.C. and New York and California, they should not be viewed by Democrats as just a political ATM. As a matter of fact, they're not just places where you go get a check. They have done really good things out there in California on climate, on, on criminal justice, and we ought to look at them as a model of how to organize. We need to stop looking at each other and segmenting each other and see each other as true allies of each other to rebuild this party. So I just want to say to you, and I want to say to you right now, we've got to energize activists at the grassroots and unite all throughout this country. We've got to get black, we've got to give Black Lives Matter 
people a place where they can express themselves electorally. You know what I'm saying? We've got to give the fight for 15. Fight for 15. They've got to be able to, the fight for 15, we've got to give them a party that they feel good about expressing themselves electorally. The, the, the immigration activists have got to have a place where they feel that there's a party that's listening to them. We've got to have a place for the folks who fight for climate justice and addressing climate to have a place where they have a party that they can support this party and they know that that party is listening to them. But if you want these things, we're going to have to fight for them. We're going to have to fight for them. I just want to say to you that we are off to a good start because Senator Bernie Sanders and Secretary Clinton combined to write the best platform the Democratic Party has ever seen. I'm telling you, I was privileged and honored to have Bernie appoint me to the platform drafting committee. And let me tell you, good things came out of it. Because of that collaboration and that unity, we got groundbreaking language in the platform on college debt, on apprenticeship programs for students who don't want to go to college but who want to get a good job and work with their hands, on expanding Social Security, expanding it, big, bigging it up, right? On the fight for 15, on the death penalty, on on high environmental standards. We got the best platform we've ever had. We've got to use it to move forward. We can organize with this very important tool. And I just want to say that if you will take up this battle and you will pledge to yourself and each other that your love for this country outweighs any beef you may have with anyone, if you will promise to yourself that you will work hard every single day to make this Democratic Party really work for the people, then we are not only looking at victory in 2018 and redistricting in 2020, we are looking at a generation full of success for working people. Republicans in 1964 thought that they were at the bottom and they were down and out. People said conservatism was dead as a philosophy because Goldwater lost to, uh, uh, to, to Johnson in a historic uh, number. And yet those guys, they're so committed to making themselves more money and excluding people that they climbed back and they won and then they won some more. And in 1980, they culminated in the election of Ronald Reagan. I'm telling you, I don't want to be like them. I don't believe what they believe. But I will say I do admire determination when I see it. And you and I better have the same level, if not more, determination for working people. Now, let me just say this. Let me say this. And then I just want to tell you what some things I want to ask you to do. Then I'm going to stop talking. I just want to say this. As Democrats, liberals, progressives, the left, we stand for the right values. We stand for the right values. And I think that we, because we stand for the right values, we think that's all we have to do is stand for the right values. The people on the right, they know that the program they're pushing is only going to benefit about 1% of the people. But they still live in a democracy, so they have to figure out a way to win even if they only stand for 1%. So they must divide, they must distract, they must make you uh, di disunified and discouraged. They want to discourage you. And they work at it all the time. So they're pushing photo ID laws. So they're pushing, they're trying to hold your wages down. They're trying to break up the right to organize. They're trying to get people to, to, to feel that government just doesn't work and it can't be, do anything good. They're always on this. We have got to understand that just being right is not enough. We've got to be unified. We've got to be active. We've got to be fighting together. We've got to be pushing the right program. We've got to strengthen and unify at the grassroots level. And we need a Democratic Party that's going to help us do that. Yeah. That's what we got to have. So if you're ready to do those things, we are ready to win. Now, I need to ask you to do just a few things. Will you consider doing some things here? Yeah. One is, Bernie said, and let me, let, can we just thank Bernie Sanders one more time? 
Thank you, Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Bernie said that we need to sign those petitions. We absolutely got to get a million signatures, okay? Can y'all help us do that? That means you got you to gotta get on Twitter. You got to get on Facebook. You got to get on Hustle. You got to get on whatever it is to get on and get, get us those million, those million signatures on that petition. If there are DNC members in your state, gently and politely tell them that you would like them to support Ellison for DNC chair. <laughs> okay, okay, there you go. And just tell them that you, as a you know, supporter of the party, would like to see Ellison as the DNC chair. Just, just let, let them know how you feel. Now, don't be too hard on them, okay? Just, you know what I mean? But let them know how you feel now. Also, we need to be doing meetups all over this country. Invite folks to your home, 10, seven or eight people, and just talk about what our country really needs and what y'all can do together on the local level to do it. I'm talking about meetups where people can meet like once a month, get some cookies, tea, coffee, whatever y'all like, and just say, you know what? What if we did this? Or what if we did that? And then maybe you could have a listening session to really feel how people are doing. Here's the other thing. There's a lot of folks who voted Obama, Obama, Trump. Don't reject them. Ask them. What are you thinking about? How do you feel now? Are you willing to work with us now? Did he disappoint you or do you still feel satisfied because I'm gonna tell you there's a whole lot of folks that after they leave that health care they're gonna be a little bit annoyed but don't but don't push them away bring them in right be kind right but bring them in and the last thing I want to ask you to do is just understand that there's a lot of folks who might have their family roots south of the border and a guy who just got elected said build a wall these people need our support. These are our brothers and our sisters. And we can't let them feel vulnerable and afraid. One of, a, dear friend of mine, a dear friend of mine said to me recently that she was called to a meeting with her friend and they were sitting at the kitchen table and she brought her little five-year-old daughter with her and she's like smart as a whip. You know them little five-year-old girls who, you know, they're a pistol, right? And my friend told me that her friend said to her, if me and my husband are picked up and deported, you know, you know, Juanita is born in America, she's a citizen, would you take care of her? You understand? Think about having that conversation. That's real for a lot of people. There's other people who were told that they were going to be banned from immigrating here based on their religion. People who are Muslim. Be a friend. There are people who are gay, lesbian. There are people who are, uh, there's, the anti-Semitism has really popped up. You know, you got these people with the swastikas, all kinds of ugly stuff. You got to stand with everybody who is feeling vulnerable right now because one of the things that Trump has uncorked is that hate machine and we have got to resist it stand up against it and our best weapon against it is our own solidarity yeah. 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 let's remake the democratic party everybody are we all in for keith are we all in for keith Thank you everybody very much. Get home safely and have a good holiday and be ready to fight.